that um, there's going to be one angel that takes that Satan and takes him and sends him into the last place he'll ever be. He might seem so powerful and he's got his ways for sure. But the Spirit of God is the one who wants to rule and reign in our lives. And he knows every trick that Satan has and will give us wisdom and power to defeat every work of the enemy. Let's bless him together. Father, we honor you. We magnify your name, O oh God. You are worthy of every bit of praise and more. God, the plan that you have put together is so perfect. Your truth is so just absolutely perfect that Satan has had years and years and generations and millennia to try to find one niche and one, one place in your armor, God, that's not covered. He has found nothing. We stand in your truth, O oh God. We thank you that you have included us in this perfect plan. Thank you that you have brought us into a place of salvation, the place you desire us to be with you. And so, God, today we just want to honor you and bless you. God, we pray for those who are struggling with health right now, and we ask, oh God, that your spirit of healing would touch every life. God, those with sinus infections and those with bladder infections and those with cancer, in the name of Jesus, we declare your right to defeat every work of the enemy. We love you, God, because your power is great. God, if there's someone battling depression, we take authority over it in the name of Jesus Christ and declare your truth to every lie of the enemy. We thank you, God. Help us to believe, oh God. We believe, but help our unbelief. The places we haven't yet been tested, the places we have not yet secured, help us, oh God, to walk in that liberty. And we honor you this morning for all that you're doing and yet what you're going to do in these days. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, worship team. Such a great job and just love it. Bless you. Bless you. Well, we welcome everybody to River of Life this morning. Um, I want to thank uh, Church, who happens to be my employer, for a couple weeks vacation. It was really nice of you to let us go. We was going to go anyhow, but we just appreciated that you said yes. <laughs> and uh, are thankful for time away. But as you know, some of you have been here a while. Time away for me means lots of time for meditation. And I have a message today that I'm just going to preface it this way. Please just stay with me, okay? Because I believe that there's something profound in this message. I was on a bike ride. I got to ride my bike almost every day when we were down in Florida. And um, just a number of things that God brings to your attention in a different culture. I uh, got to enjoy seeing fishing boats come in. I got to enjoy touring through a marina and uh, doing some discovery way back in and animals and birds that we don't see here among those, you know, horrible palm trees that just speak life to you when you are from the north. And, um, but I was on a bike ride one day and my habit is that I put my phone in a little phone holder and turn on my Pandora, and I've got several artists that I really enjoy. And during one of my rides, I heard a song that I really had not paid attention to before. And one of the lines grabbed me that morning, and it has become the message this morning. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you uh, this morning about something that I have never preached before, and I'm going to say most of you have never heard before. I'm going to talk to you about the principle of the table. And uh, this is something that just, I don't know why it lit up for me now. I've read so many things in Scripture and studied, and yet 
man, when something comes alive to you, I, you know, I, I told the worship team this morning, I said, do you ever come to that place where you feel like you're weird because you believe that God's given you a revelation, but you're not sure that it's for anybody else, and yet you believe it's so profound that you want to share it with people? And, and so that's what this is this morning. I trust by the Holy Spirit that we can minister this to you, but this morning what I want to talk to you, and we're not talking just about any table, but if you're really talking about the table, there's one main table that we always think about, and that's the dinner table. That's the place where fellowship is found. That's the place that love is shared and people are invited and so the table that I'm talking about this morning is something that I, I, I mean, I have never put this together before. I, I don't want to say that too often, but when something's, you know, if you've read the Bible over and over and over and over and over again, and, and then you get a new revelation, man, it, it just does something to you. You're going, how much more is there, God? And I'm pretty certain there's lots more. But the table represents a place of provision, born of love. One of the things that I see in the changing culture we're in is less dinner table, more island, more sitting in a chair, my favorite place. But it used to be a place where it gathered those who knew their place. And typically at a dinner table in a family, you had a belonging there and the dinner table was in a sense a place of identity. It represents someone planning, providing, and serving others that they value at the table. And the place the, the, the place that the table is best known for is called home. Are you with me so far? God introduced the table in the book of Exodus chapter 25. If you know your scripture, some of you will know it very well, so you know that Exodus 25, you are getting the instruction for the tabernacle. And so you can figure out what table is going to be in there, and that is the table of showbread, it's called. And it was in the inner court in front of the place, the veil of the most holy place, and there was instruction given to the children of Israel and to the priests and to the, the tenders of the tabernacle that they were to bake 12 loaves of bread and put them in two rows of six and that that should be done every Sabbath day. And in verse 30 of Exodus 25... God gave them instruction and said, And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. And I want to I help you understand this principle of the table. The table always represents somebody's intention. They are the ones who are setting the table. And then there's those who are invited to the table. And as I have studied in this now, this uh, table effect, I see that God used the table of showbread as an introduction to those of us who are Christian. Because he knew that there was going to be the need for this understanding later on. And so he said there's going to be a table that's going to require your attention. And it's going to require your planning. And it's going to require your provision. And it's going to be you doing it for me. That's what he wants us to know. And so he told them this is what you're going to do continually. 
You will put 12 loaves on there. And then this is going to be for the priests. This is what they're going to have as ministers of, of God. And it's going to be for them. So that he, he just said, you know, the whole idea of the tabernacle, this is the shortened version, paraphrased, and probably not that great, but the idea is God gave specific instruction all the way through, you know, Exodus 25 to 30 and on through other places, all the things that were required so that there could be the instilled presence of God coming into the place that he said he would come. But he needed them to do the necessary things. But what he was really doing, and I know that some people think, well, God just wanted to make them jump through hoops. I don't believe that. I believe that he was setting the pattern so that we would understand how valuable the presence of God is, but also at a later table that we're going to talk about, how he would give us the understanding of how precious the table is. And these are the things I want to make sure that I, I get to you. Because when, when you're doing this, I don't believe that, I mean, if you had all wisdom, all knowledge, and all truth, would you waste your time saying things that weren't important? No, everything you'd say would be perfect and necessary. And that's how we have to see God. God's not one that loves to make people jump through hoops. It's always plan. It's always purpose. It's always example. And when we see him that way, it'll change our perspective a bit about how we respond to him. So I believe that God knew the value of relationship and he wanted man to realize that it's going to take investment. And so that's why he gave him this structure. And I also believe that he was telling them, you don't come to me without preparation. You don't just come haphazardly into my presence. You come intentionally. There's another story that I would love to talk to you about. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And this kind of gives the idea of what the table is all about. Most of you probably know this name. His name is Mephibosheth. And in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David, King David by now, realizes that there was things that have happened in the past and after being chased by Saul for many years and yet befriended by Saul's son Jonathan and his closest friend and his confidant Jonathan that this became something of a treasure in his life. And after King Saul and Jonathan were killed David heard that there was still a descendant of Jonathan's and he sent for Mephibosheth. Now if you know the story of Mephibosheth you know that he couldn't walk. When they were escaping from the, the battle that had been waged when they had heard that Saul had been killed and Jonathan the nurse carrying Mephibosheth dropped him and it caused him to be lame and so you have that story. And then yet in 2 Samuel 9, David sends for him and tells his caretaker to bring him into the place of the palace. And in chapter 9, verse 7, it says, And David said unto him, Mephibosheth, Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. The point of this reading this passage is simply this. I believe that there is something that God has instilled in the heart of those who love him. And believe me, there will be more. I'm not asking you to stretch your mind in this thing. But I believe that there's something that God does on the inside of us when we really have a relationship with him. 
that we have a desire to see people come and especially those who have been broken or those who are disadvantaged and we want to see the power of God and the provision of God come into their life so that they can realize that they're not forgotten. They're not off to the side. They're not some leftover. But God loves them the same as he does us. And when Mephibosheth was brought in, you'll find in a later story that there was a time when Mephibosheth left and had Ziba take him away because he was afraid because he thought that David had changed his mind. And when he was brought back, he said, Mephibosheth, why, why, after what I said, would you consider leaving and not coming under my table? And he said, I just feared because... I wouldn't even have a life if it wouldn't be for you. And when you see this, and you, and I, I look, I, I studied, if you want to know how I study, this is how I study. If I know that I'm supposed to look up table, I look up every place that table is spoken in Scripture and I read every verse so that I can get an understanding if God has a principle there or if this is just, hey, it's just a table, man. Well, I believe there's a principle here. The love of God in us sets the desire to set a table for others. Invitation to a table that we don't belong at humbles us and can even cause fear in us. Because we know it's only by the goodness of the invitee that we sit at the table. I'm Mephibosheth. Right? Turn with me to a passage in Luke chapter 22 if you would. I read this passage three weeks ago when we did communion. The setting of this passage is that this is the last Passover. And Jesus has told the disciples to go get it ready. Gave them instruction on how they would know where to go. And they're just supposed to follow some guy that's carrying a water pot. And tell him, the master needs your room. You know. Just do it. They did that. They got it ready. And Jesus came and told them, he said, with great desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you. They didn't understand, I don't believe, that this honestly would be the last Passover. Because Jesus is the Passover. But then he got up from the table according to the other gospels and he took a towel and a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet. And you know the story that he washed some of the disciples and then he came to Peter and Peter said, you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, Peter, what I'm doing you don't understand. He said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part with me. Well, then don't just wash my feet. Wash me all over. Peter, those who are already clean only need to have their feet washed and they're clean. What I'm doing, you don't understand. He said, he talks about the servant and the master. And he said, if I, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, so ought you also to wash one another's feet. And then in verse 27 of chapter 22, he says, For whether or for what, which one is greater? He that sitteth at meat or at dinner 
or he that serveth? Is it not he that sitteth at the meal? But I am among you as he that serveth. You are they which with, have continued with me in my temptation or in my life in this world. You've been with me all the way. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. They uh, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I want to make a, just a simple, what I believe, clarification from Scripture now. I believe there's a physical table, and I believe there's a spiritual table. The physical table is simply, and I'll read something to show you what I'm talking about here. The physical table is us in our humanity preparing, providing, and doing the necessary things necessary to serve him the way he wants to be served. It is us bringing who we are in our humanity and in service doing what is necessary to serve him. The spiritual table is any time that he is present, he's in charge of the table. And that becomes a spiritual table that he does the serving and we become the recipients. I believe, and this is, you can, you can argue this, I'm not even interested in argument because I, I just, these are the things that come to me and it makes sense to me so I'll, I'll say them, okay? But I believe that that last Passover and with him sharing the, when he gave him the bread and the cup and said, this is my body and this is my blood. I believe that this was the transfer of the table. I believe that up until that time, they were just doing what he wanted and, and you know, just, hey, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And yet Jesus gave the discourse to them and said, I no longer call you servants but now I call you friends. You see, that to me is the place of transfer because your servants serve you at the table. Your friends you invite to the table. And I believe that there's something that God wants to put in us that we become less afraid of the spiritual table and we don't concentrate so much on trying to measure up by how we set the physical table. Because I believe that it takes spiritual people who understand the ways of God to realize he actually wants to serve us. He wants to come in with presence. And he wants to bring life to us by the Spirit of God. And he wants us to sit at his table and enjoy his presence. Amen. But so many times we're afraid. Let me, let me go to another passage with you because I, I believe this will help you. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to explain the physical table to you, okay? I believe that there's so much involved here that I don't want to, I don't want to lose any part of it because as, I mean, what I'm hoping to do, and I'll give you a fair warning. Sammy, are you on Facebook? At the end of this service, I'm going to have you cut Facebook off. And so I'm warning our Facebook watchers right now. Because what we're going to do is I'm going to show the video of the song that, that sparked this in me. But I played it for my wife and I'm telling you, we were sitting by a pool. And this is how it is when it becomes profound. I mean, I couldn't help it. The tears just run. I put it on repeat and the tears just run down my face because I, I try to think, God, how, how can the creator of the universe ever invite me to a table and want to serve me? That's whacked. That makes no sense. But he's also given us an understanding of what sets his table Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31, it says this, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, his rightful place. 
And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Now some people would say with nations, I don't believe, I, I'm, I'm one who believes it's individual. He just gathers all the races And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come into my house. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took you in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when did we see you sick, or in prison, and come unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. You see, the Lord doesn't require fellowship. He loves fellowship. What he's inviting us to is to the spiritual understanding of how the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can be living on the inside of us by the Spirit of God. But what we end up doing is his will by meeting the needs of those who he brings into our path. And we don't do it for them so we can say we did. We do it for them because that's how we set the table for him. Because his glory is fulfilled in being revealed to these people by the love that has changed your mind and invited you to a table that you have no business at, just like me. Does that make sense to you? I mean, it's so humbling to think that not only do you get to set the table for someone, not only do you get to be used of God to be the instrument of God's love into people's lives, but that that's actually the best thing we can do for Him. He says, I don't require anything. I already have everything. But what I'm after is them. And you're my ministry to them. You're the one setting my table so that they'll also be invited. And when I see that, I just go, God, I, I don't... I don't even understand why, how you do this. But he doesn't require anything for himself. And yet I'm to be that instrument of God also then that doesn't require anything for myself. I'm already invited to his table. I'm just going to be very straight with you, church. This is why I don't like a lot of fluff on Sundays. Because in my mind, this is us setting at his table. This is what he has set up that he says, come, gather, gather. Just come and sit at the table and I'll come and minister to you by the things that I have set up. I'm the one that organized and set up the church. I'm the one who called you to assembly. I'm the one who can speak life and wisdom to you. I'm the one who can meet your needs. I'm the one who can call out deliverance. I'm the one who can bring healing and life. I'm the one that can mend broken relationships. I'm bringing the goods. All I need you to do is come and enjoy me. And the more we make it about us, the less opportunity he gets to serve us. Every place has their own way of doing things. But I'm concerned how the church operates in the service of God. We've dressed up our worship services into something that I think titillates the flesh so much more than is necessary. 
And what it does, it becomes a replacement for the true presence of God, which should cause us to be on our face and weep before him because he's an almighty God that we have no business coming into contact with, but he's invited us to his table. Then there's the spiritual table. This is where God comes in his presence and we come in our humanity and he serves us. But this is where I believe the spiritual table becomes so, so, so powerful. How many of you have been in, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but how many of you have been in a place where the spirit of God is so real in presence to you that you're going, man, I, I, don't, I don't want to move. I don't want to think too much. I don't want anything to change right now. Because I know he's with me. I look at this is something I want to speak very very strongly to us there are those of us who major in one side of this or the other there's some of us who just because of the way we, we think we're so much more involved in the physical table than we are the spiritual table then there's others who want to major so much in the spiritual table that we lose sight of the physical table. And the Christian is supposed to have both of these things incorporated in their life because it's, it's a little bit like what the gifts of the Spirit do in the church. When you're used in the gifts of the Spirit in the church, it edifies you. But it's meant to edify everybody and if we're only seeking our self-edification, then you're going to waste your time and we won't profit. But when, the, when it's used in its proper sense, the gifts of the Spirit are meant to edify it so that everybody goes, that's God. That's just God. So when he comes in the spiritual table, some of us get uncomfortable. We're a little bit like Peter at that foot washing time. You, you, you want me to sit at your table? What, what am I supposed to do? How, how, do I, how do I operate at your table? I want to help you today to know how to operate at the table. It's like when I see people coming up to the altar and something has drawn you to the altar. Man, I encourage you, don't be silent at the altar. Tell him why you came. Tell him what you want. You don't need anybody else because see at the table, it's you and it's him. And when he is with you and you're with him, there is something about that that becomes this closet of space and he's with you and he's looking at you and wanting to know how can I best serve you? Do you know your needs so that you'll know that I can meet it? Do you, can you tell me, can you articulate what it is that you want from me? And when you tell me, I want you to know I'm working on it already. I'm with you and I'm for you and I'll take you through. But I want to know that you know why you're sitting at my table. Because I didn't bring you to my table just so you could be impressed. I brought you to my table so you could be changed. You're not going to wash my feet. If, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any place with me. You'll not sit at my table if you don't allow me to do the things I need to do in your life. I'm not playing a game here. I'm building a kingdom. And you have to understand the principles of the kingdom. And it started way back there with the table of showbread. There's going to be preparation and it's going to take continuous attention. And there's a purpose to it because at some point you're going to be invited to a table that you didn't prepare. He prepared it for us. Amen. 
that place at his table is where we lose our personal identity and are overwhelmed to be in his presence. You know some of the things that haunt us the most? Trying to sit at the feet of Jesus is our identity. I'm not good enough. Or, I know, I'm not cooperating very well. But if you realize the purpose of the table is not to call you out, but to call you in, then you won't be ashamed at his table. You'll come and sit and be overwhelmed. It's a place of revelation. It's a place of peace. And it's the place of spiritual identity. I want to say this. When you're truly with him in that spiritual table, it's home. It's better than home here. Because this place where you are, I mean, if, if you can understand, do you know why this is something just crazy to me? It's because, see, when I get revelation from God, then I know I hear. Hallelujah, I hear. I hear someone I've never seen. I hear revelation that I could not know. I hear wisdom and things being put together that I know are way over my pay grade. I know that this is something that I didn't bring to myself and therefore I know I'm in fellowship with God. But it brings me to his table because when I know that I have revelation from him, when I know that there's something greater than me living on the inside of me and there's something that's possessing my mind that I couldn't come up with, then I know that I'm sitting at his table and there's no better place to be. And see, friends, this is why I believe the church is missing it because so many times we're trying to set a table for you instead of us wanting to sit at the feet of Jesus. Why do worship leaders feel such pressure? All they're trying to do is clear the cloud of personal identity so that the God of glory can come in and identify his and let him sit at his table. It shouldn't be work. It should be invitation. Come in. Come in. I know you've had a week that's been tough, but come in and sit at the table. It's going to be awesome. I don't care what they're wearing. I don't care who does that wrong. I don't care if it's out of place. I didn't come to worship them. I came to worship him. I just want an invitation to his table. Because there is no better place. Humanity has no place at his table. True worshipers worship in what? So we get out of our personal identity. And we take on our spiritual understanding and identity. And that gives us the right to be called the children of God and the family of God gathers at the table that he has put together so that he can serve us and bring us the necessary things so that we get to know him better. Does that make sense to you? Oh, I tell you, this, this just, it so just fills me up. I mean, tell you, I'm, I'm riding my bike through this. It's called a preserve or one's called a reserve and it's, you know, hundreds of acres of just wasteland swamp, but they've got a nice path through there. So I'm listening to this music, and I love to sing parts, and so I'm just singing. And so these people that are going by, hey, whatever. I'm not on a physical bike ride right now. I'm in a spiritual climate, and it makes my bike ride shorter. And it just brings me to places where I don't even know what to think anymore. And sometimes the tears well up in your eyes, and you're just going, man, this is the way it ought to be. I just love this bike ride. And I want everybody to know them. 
them times. Maybe you don't know how to sit at his feet. It's all right. But the invitation is open. You just got to go as uncomfortable and as awkward as you feel and go, God, I don't even know how to act when I sit at your table. But what I want to do is I just want to sit here and see if you're going to say something. And what you do is after a while, you'll start seeing things and hearing things and you're going, is that you? Well, then you realize it wasn't your own thoughts. And you weren't thinking about that. And pretty soon you get comfortable in that spot and you're going, God, this is too much for me. I don't think I want you to wash my feet. But something draws you back. And you do it again. And you find out that there's something precious about losing yourself in his presence. And at times not wanting to come out because you realize that you're safer there than any place else where you are. I don't want to miss anything, so I want to check my notes. The place of the richest blessing of God is at his table. It's not wealth. It's not stuff. For the Christian, the richest place is sitting at his table. But I want to help us understand something else. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read a couple verses, but I think you you know what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He talks about the Lord's table. And he's talking about it in a physical sense. But it's the communion table. What is represented by our the top of our baptistry over there, we would call that, in a sense, a communion table. It would be like the place of the mercy seat in the tabernacle. It's where the priest gets to go in once a year and and enjoy the presence of God. Well, now that we are born of the Spirit of God, that veil's been torn, and we who have been made kings and priests unto our God are allowed to come past the veil and come into full fellowship, and now we have communion with him. But it doesn't take away the preparation that was designed by the table of showbread. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, it says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and at the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he And you see, we're in the practice of having communion and what we say is, let's just make sure that we're clear when we take the Lord's Supper because Paul wrote and said, if you drink it unworthily for this cause, many are sick and some have even died. But you see, because we come so much to him in the physical table, we think on last week and the last couple days and maybe we haven't done so good or something. I want to tell you, I don't believe that that's what the Lord is after. We know what table we're sitting at. We know if our intention has been to sit at the devil's table or at his table. We know by the pattern of our life and the, and the values and priorities that are shaped in our lives whether whose table we're sitting at. And I'm telling you, that's what he says. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? In other words, you mean with everything I've offered you, you would still choose that table? Would you still go after that and think that that's going to be a win for you? Is that somehow entice you into something? Because if that's the way it is, then you're thinking from a personal identity and that is from a physical table and that's not the participation of sitting at his feet. Does that make sense to you folks? I don't believe that's any different than the table of showbread. If you now can make that correlation. 
I want you to have 12 loaves on the table all the time. I want you to have the bread set out there every Sabbath day. I want there to be a continual attention to the necessary provision for me to have presence in your life. I, it needs to be something that grabs your attention and you prioritize and you make it something that you, you really have put out in your life. And that's going to be what brings you to my table. But if you think you're just going to play catch up and just come into my table haphazardly and serve the table of the devil through the week and come back to my table, you're not going to be invited to my table. And that's what we're afraid to preach nowadays. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, you don't have to turn there. I think you know this one. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him and he with me. He turns it into a spiritual table. His invitation isn't back to a physical table. God's always interested in bringing us to his spiritual table where our minds and our lives are captivated by the beauty of who he is and what he offers. And so that's why when instead of, 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 of us grieving like those who have no hope at times when some are departed from us, we have to back up from that and say, can I tell you what they get to do today? They sit at a physical, spiritual table with him. We should be the jealous ones. God, I want to come and I want to sit at your table to where I will be forever. I want to have that invitation not only now, I want to be able to come into this kingdom to where it's going to be so satisfied in me that I will sit at your table continually and I will get to look on the one who has brought me all the way through. Oh, we'll be thrilled to see our loved ones. I was talking to Jenny this morning. She misses her Denny. Why wouldn't you spend that many years together? But that still comes from the place where we are on this side. And I believe we're going to be so overwhelmed there that all we will do is rejoice in everything we've overcome and everything we've come through and to see a table that is ready for us. It's one thing to know that there's a house or a mansion if you want to go that far with your name on it. But what we ought to be overwhelmed at is a place at his table. What's the most common scripture For a table. Psalm 23. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. It doesn't matter the environment I'm in. He prepares a table for me. When I hear that verse and I see it in the way that I see it now, I'm going, David, when, when God called David a man after his own heart, that right there should tell you that he understood things that most didn't, if anybody at that time. Because he knew that an invitation to a table provided by the Lord was a place where you didn't have to worry about anything else. But what had brought him to that place? Oh, he had seen God come through for him over and over and over again. And yet when he's been chased and all these things, the Lord is actually my shepherd. He's the one that is going to make things work in my life. Therefore, I, 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 I shall not want. I, it doesn't mean I won't like things. It just means that if I need something, he's the one that's going to make something come through for me. And when it comes down to this, and I, I feel this so strongly, 
and maybe I along with many of you. We need to concentrate on the Lord's table more than we concentrate on the enemy. I think of the days we're in and how much the news can get our focus onto how evil things in this world are. But I believe today that there's a cure in our hearts and minds for how evil things are in this day and that is sitting at the table with Jesus Christ. And let him wash our minds of worry, anxiety. Even those of you with small children that look of things today, do you think you love your children more than he does? Has he not watched over you when your parents thought the days were evil? Do we think we're at the very end? We have no idea. It could get much worse and it could go on for years and years and years. And your children may face the same thing and have children and say, oh man, these are evil days. Yes, and the Lord has kept us through them all. But you don't get that by the news. You get that at the table. And you understand that at the table in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. And the best place to sit at the table is at his right hand. Because at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So if you get to pick your seat, pick the one at his right hand, okay? But you see, Psalm 23, what David said, you prepare a table for me in the presence of all the stuff that's going on in my life. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me every day of my life and where will I do and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as if it's my home forever there's my identity I sit at his table I sit right beside him and he wants to commune with me because I've prepared to sit at his table does this make sense to you folks I want to tell you there's something so sweet Something so perfect. I had experiences. I'm going to show one of these in another message sometime. I'll just bait you just a little bit since we got lots of time. I went on a bike ride. Went down to a fish market. And I went through there and I'm one who... If it looks like there's a chance I could go back into there, I go back in there. Unless there's a gate, I'm not, you know, but I'm not trespassing unless it says no trespassing, right? So I went back in this fish market and I'm so glad I did. I didn't realize that there was a little eating place back in here and there were people sitting around and that's when I noticed a sign. And then as I was leaving, I noticed another sign And then as I was going down past it, I noticed another object. And then as I went around the corner, I saw a boat. And that's where I'm going to leave it for next time. Because I went and I took pictures of each one of those things. And God spoke to me so profoundly about those kind of things. And what I'm saying to you is, I was on a bike ride but I was sitting at the table. You don't have to be still to sit at the table. It's great if you can be, but you can sit at the table doing what you do. You can sit at the table and knowing that he wants to meet with you and he will provide for you. I just want to take away your anxieties, your worries, your fears, your shame, and say the best place you can be is to sit at his table. Sammy, We're going to say goodbye to our Facebook people because we don't want to go to Facebook jail. But we will try to put, if we can, I don't know if Aaron, if you've got that for him, that he could do it, but we could put the URL for this song on the uh, Facebook comments and, um, or meta or whatever it is. And uh, tell us when you're done, Sam, and that way we won't get kicked off. (laughs) 